this time. The Lord can stop. What flashed through my mind that he might not make it? My legs. Keep breathing. I can't think of a worse situation that he could have gotten himself in. Three, two, one. So we're looking for a black red through in black water. They live in high stack. At any second, the shark can become aggressive. Then you are definitely shark food. Beneath 12,000 square miles of rugged wilderness hides the highest concentration of caves in North America. I always really crave the wild places, places where you don't see any trace of human beings. Places like Cascade Cave. And no one's been in here in a while. <laughs> a place so secretive, you need a key to get inside. Andrew Munoz leads a mission to reach the bottom of this one mile network. His head cam records the journey. If I had any idea that we were gonna go through what we went through, I wouldn't have gone. Use the rope if you want, or use the wall. Really good right there. Andrew's friend and former boss, Jason Story, is the rookie of the group. This is just his fifth time caving. So I think we'll just get you to climb the wall and we'll just have this on as your backup. Yeah. I'll do some back pressure and it'll just feed on its own. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. And then, do you remember how to get this thing off? I'll figure it out. Zach Zariski brings up the rear. I hadn't met Jason before actually until the day of the trip. We kind of hit it off in the aspect that he liked to cave, I liked to cave, he liked to rock climb, I liked to rock climb. Can you bring that bag over? You got you got. Four hours later, they're nearly at the bottom of Cascade Cave. Above ground, a ferocious storm hits the island, dumping a trillion gallons of rain. Ice cold water rushes into the cave. Yeah, so basically just one good foot spike. And just doing a big press over the top there. There was a lot of water. We had overextended ourselves, and we were at very great risk. The team must get out, and fast. Jason goes first. It's not super solid, so don't bump me. Oh. OK, good. Yeah, I'm better now. And just remember, when you get up there, I'll pass you the rope up. So take this one up here. Where? Turn around the other way. This one on that side. Okay. Yeah, elbow in. You got it. Yeah. There you go. Nice. You're on it, man. You're on it. The first stage is a 12-foot vertical climb. Then they face the notorious Bastard's Crawl. This 20-foot-long corridor tapers into a choke point only inches wide. It's the only way out. And then this next section, head first or foot first? Oh, head first for sure. Yeah. Like up through the screen, all the way through? Yeah, yeah, head first up the, up the swan piece. Yeah. Okay, so. I knew it was going to be a challenge. I was worried that someone was going to have trouble with the climb. I'm worried about Zach. I'm worried about myself. There was a very small space to get through without getting into the flow of the water. As Zach waits for Jason to squeeze through Bastard's Crawl, the narrow passage fills with frigid water. Okay, okay, just relax. Just relax, gang. Okay, you want to back out, maybe? Just chill out, James. Just relax, man. It's all good. He was stuck in the absolute tightest part with six to eight inches of space between the water and the roof. Yeah, okay, just go, man. Let's go. We're right here. Okay? Yeah. You're in the air. You're in the air. Don't make any fast moves, okay, dude? Yeah. Where are your feet? Can you move your feet? You're all good, okay? Yeah. Hands out. Yeah. Okay? 
He was stuck in the flow of the water right up to his neck, and he couldn't move. One hand out here. Okay. One hand on that side. Yeah. You got good. You got good hands. You got good hands. Yeah. Talk to me, dude. You got good hands. Yeah. Okay. Foot drop. Okay. You're on it. You're on the other side. Where's that foot? Okay. Push on me. Push on me. Yeah. Okay. You're on something. And I want you to put your feet up. Put your feet on me, okay? Feel for me. Keep coming. Okay? Keep it up. You got good hands? Yeah. Okay? Slowly this way, okay? Oh, you. Towards me, dude. I knew that I had just a couple of minutes to try and help him. To the side. Solid hands. Keep your feet up. Feet up on the move. Feet up. Up on the He's at risk of drowning within the next couple of minutes. Feet up. Good hands. Come on. Get up. Keep coming, dude. Keep coming. You're not stuck. I feel completely helpless and out of control. Keep breathing, hands out. I was worried that I was going to watch this person die in front of me. You killed! Come on, Jake! Come on, Jake! Come on, Jake! Hands out! You're still breathing, okay? Hands out to the side! Speed up! Come towards me! Come this way! Speed up! Towards me! Head up! Head up! Hands down! Lift it in! Okay? Lift your ass up! And float! Lift your ass up! And float, Jake! Come on! Okay? Keep breathing! Come on! There you there, okay? Look at me, okay? You made it, all right? Yeah. It's scary you made it, okay? <laughs> Let's chill out for a second, okay? I need you to crawl that way, all right? In a second. Okay? In a second. I need you to start moving, Jake. I need you to start moving, okay? My leg's caught. It's all right, dude. We're going to get out of here, all right? Yeah. My left leg. Okay, I'm going to move. Okay? Just relax. He was exhausted trying to fight the water. I need to come up with a plan to get him out. Jason is stuck near the entrance of Bastard's Crawl, trapping Andrew and Zach in the base of the cave. Where are we at, Jay? My left leg is caught. It's straight down. Okay? to stay positive in the message that I'm giving to him. I'm trying to offer active solutions to get him out of the water. Here. 
Finally, Jason's foot is free. Out the water, we're going to take a breather, we're going to kill. Yeah. We're going to assess the water situation. Okay, right. Oh, we're not going to do that again, all right, buddy? Sure enough. I need you, man. Yeah, I'm not going to need you. Oh, okay. No problem, dude. Jason has been submerged in ice-cold water for eight minutes. I thought, how can you not be shivering? You must be freezing. I'm shivering. And then I think, right. He's progressed past shivering. That's because Jason has hypothermia. His body is shutting down. Big boy, stop. Jason's heart has slowed to conserve energy, restricting blood flow to his vital organs. Unchecked, the cold could kill him. Good breath, man, okay? You're gonna start to get a little bit cold. We had no time to waste to getting him out, or he was gonna die. A winter storm batters Vancouver Island, flooding a cave system. Okay, okay, just relax, just relax, gang. Trapping three friends deep underground. Jason's story survives drowning, barely, but is suffering from hypothermia and fighting for his life. I need you, man. I know that I need to raise the temperature. We don't have a lot of equipment with us, and we needed to improvise some solutions based on what you have. Andrew has a portable stove. He heats the freezing water and showers Jason in it. He started shivering after one or two applications of hot water and that gave me a big sense of relief. It meant that his brain hadn't been damaged. Jason will die without medical help. But this deep underground, there's no way to reach 911. It was pretty obvious that Jay's situation wasn't getting any better without some help. It's up to Zach to make the mile-long climb alone and call for a rescue. Andrew and Jason must wait to conserve battery power. The lights and camera go out. They are alone in the dark, one mile underground. I'll never forget the ever-present roar of the water. How it rings inside your skull and vibrates your whole body to the point where you would give anything to shut that sound off. 10 maddening hours pass. The mind goes to some incredibly dark places when you are truly trapped. My daughter was still very young. I had so much guilt and fear that she'd grow up without a dad because he decided to go caving one weekend and made some bad decisions that I battled a lot with whether I needed to make a message for her. Add the camera, I had nothing but time. But uh, to me, that's giving up completely. The storm eases. The sound started to diminish ever so slightly. At first, I was like, is it getting quieter? Is that water slowing? It has to be. Andrew realizes there's an opportunity to escape the cave. Despite his condition, Jason won't be left behind. He said, I'm gonna do it, let's go. Our bodies were so broken by that point that it took every ounce to make an inch and again and again and all of a sudden you're through we're there and we are ecstatic elated beyond belief Right from the point where we made it through Bastard's Crawl, I was flying high. I was on cloud nine. I was, we've made it out of this cave was, was how I felt. Andrew and Jason have traveled no more than 20 feet. There's still a grueling mile long climb between them and safety. Jason's physical condition was really bad. He was having to pick up his own feet 
with his hands and put them on footholds and then summon each move almost like a power lifter with a big scream to move over and over and over. Almost 24 hours after they first entered the cave, they can finally see the exit. I could see lights and hear voices. It's the rescue team regrouping after a failed attempt to reach the stranded men. One of the rescuers was a friend and she was the first to sort of spot our headlamps and see that we were there and she shouted down. <laughs> I started to well up with tears. Yeah, it was just, just a feeling of being overjoyed. Okay, all team subject is out of the hole. I've been back in Cascade uh, three times since. One near-death experience could turn you fearful of a lot of things, but for me, it's made me want to have more experiences. Three, five, one, go ahead. They were hiking a known trail, fell and is injured. He fell 50 to 60 feet. A lot of people don't survive a fall of that height. The victim is Hong Bo Zhao, a 42-year-old local man out to explore Cat Mountain with his 15-year-old son. Pima County Search and Rescue races to the scene. Joining Brian on the rescue mission are pilot Pat Mackin and winch operator T.J. Price, wearing a head cam. Time is going to be the, the crucial factor. There's potential of him having life-threatening injuries up there. We got information from the patient that his son was above where he had fallen. We have one person who's in a bad location and potentially has severe injuries. We have this son unattended in a dangerous location. Hey, Brian, we're at this, uh, you see the, the scene right up here? At our, uh, did I see the guy in the white shirt? What we're gonna do is we're gonna get over, we're gonna lower you down to the victim. That door's open, locked and secure. I'm sliding to the left. Arm is going out. Arm is out in the lock position. Thomas Zhao is in danger himself. The helicopter is generating powerful winds that could blow him straight off the side of the mountain. I felt a lot of fear and panic. My main worry was my dad. I told him, like, my dad's down there. He had said he fell 50 or 60 feet, and he definitely had done that. I can't think of a, a worse situation that he could have gotten himself in. In Arizona, Pima County Search and Rescue hovers above Cat Mountain. They must save two victims, 15-year-old Thomas Shao and his dad, Hongbo, who's fallen 60 feet into a narrow crevice. This is what we're gonna get over. We're gonna lower you down to the victim. Yeah. 
Hongbo fell 25 minutes ago. 80% of trauma deaths occur in the first hour. The clock is ticking. The Tucson Mountain Valley is known for its intense desert winds, which make flying a helicopter exceptionally difficult. When the wind hits a mountain, it'll go straight up vertical. As you get closer to the mountain, you're starting to feel those winds. Pat wrestles the controls, fighting to keep the chopper steady. He has a window this big. If he goes anywhere other, I'm going to smash into the mountain. They have to get me in this crevice. I have no control. I know that it's now on me. I know that I have to keep it stable. I try not to move, because you have a life on that line. Get you out, okay? I'm just gonna get you out. You're lucky, man. Yeah. Wow. That could have got ugly. What's your name? Hombo. Hombo. I'll call you sir. It's too dangerous to stay attached to the helicopter. One gust of wind, and Pat could lose control, slamming Brian into the rocks. I unhook from the cable, and I hold the, the cable up to let them know that it's free to, to come up. They had like a, a two-foot window. And as I let go, the cable swung further into the crevice. If the cable snags a rock, the helicopter could jackknife and smash into the cliffs below. The heart skips a beat. Oh my gosh, that cable's gonna get stuck in the rock. Incredibly, the cable scrapes through. How that didn't get caught up in a rock is beyond me. Brian's now free to examine Hongbo. It's the hidden injuries that worry him the most. He had blood on his face with a head injury. If you were bleeding in your brain, that's a critical and something you need to get to the hospital immediately for, or else you could die. Can you put that arm through that hole? Can you see it? There's not enough space on the ledge to lower a stretcher in, so Brian must attach a body harness to Hongbo, okay. so a highly risky underneath. maneuver. You got a good grip? I need to make sure whatever I do isn't making him lose his footing and then fall the rest of the way. I just hovered a distance away until Brian is ready to have us come back in. Patient is packaged and ready to go. Now it's up to winch operator TJ to guide an unweighted cable directly into the narrow crevice. swing and it swayed and it was all over the place. I'm looking straight up and I can see a very small part of the helicopter. They're gonna have to be so precise, but they lowered it right into my hand. 
Now we're at the really important stage. We got to get that victim out of there. If the rescue team can get Hungbo to the emergency room less than an hour after his fall, he'll be four times more likely to survive. It is my job to keep it absolutely rock steady. There's a living human being down below us, and I do not want to injure him. I was trying to prevent him from being swung into the, to the canyon wall, but the swing was too much, and he actually hit the wall. As soon as Hungbo is clear, Pat can fly him directly out of the crevice. Forty-five minutes since he fell and smashed his head, Hungbo is on his way to the hospital. He'll make the one-hour window. But his son and his rescuer remain stranded and alone. And out here, there are no guarantees. Brian Bowl has just helped rescue an injured hiker from the top of a remote peak. Now, he's stuck in the same spot. I'm gonna need to be hoisted. That was definitely uh, what we call cliffed out. I can't go up or down. Trapped above him on the edge of the crevice is the victim's teenage son. Are you able to hike out or no? It's too steep? Okay. 30 minutes after rescuing Hungbo, the team is back. Down a few feet in the, in the crevice. Hopefully give you a bigger window. I'm just gonna sit here and let you bring the hook in. Sure. Once I got hooked in, they were able to fly out of the crevice. job's not done. The victim's 15-year-old son is still in danger of falling to his death. I don't want to get real close to him because I don't want my rotor wash blowing him around because he's still on the top of a cliff. The crevice was right there where his dad has just fell. Pat drops Brian a safe distance from the teenager. They can't rush this. At this point, everything for me is now very slow. I can go as slow as I need to go to make sure everything is, is done safely. That was a pretty nasty fall, dude. I could see some, some nervousness in his eyes. He was trying to be brave. Having the last person that needs to be rescued off the mountain is always a, a calming feeling. Just over an hour after the 911 call came in, everyone is finally safe. Scans reveal Hungbo has multiple injuries, including spinal fractures and two bleeds on the brain. But thanks to Pima County Sheriff's Department, he eventually makes a full recovery and is still hiking with his son. I think I'm just um, overwhelmed by the joy, by the relief. I'm just feeling so happy that I'm alive. The coast of New South Wales is Nine Mile Reef. It's a magnet for spear fishermen. When you're spear fishing, it's like hunting, but you're as far out of your element and comfort zone as you possibly can get. I just love the ocean. My first time diving, seeing Trev slap some big fish down on the deck. And I was just like, this is awesome. So I got the bug early and I haven't stopped. But they aren't the only predators here. It's known to the locals as a sharky spot. There was a couple of tracks. Trevor Ketchian films on a head cam as he spearfishes with his friend, Dylan Briggs. Dylan's dad, Scott, drives the boat. And then the shark came in, so I just ran my hand again. She started swimming up. 
Like, let's get this to the top. Are you going down first? I'll watch you back. Dylan started diving over five years ago. Trev taught him everything because that, that's Trev's passion. By the time they resurface, underwater currents have carried Dylan and Trevor over 100 feet away from the boat. Your responsibility as a driver is to make sure that the people in the water are safe, that they can get to the boat. In the boat above, Scott must estimate where Trevor and Dylan will emerge. They're in the drink. I've got my eyes on them. One of them goes down while the other guy stays up. Sometimes they both go down together. They're down there for a minute and a half. It's been a good day so far. The boys have already caught three fish, but the conditions are shifting. The wind's picked up to 25 knots. The swell's picked up. They dive once more. When I drove to where I thought they were, or should be, they weren't. I started to panic because I should have had them in the boat within three minutes. Scott knows they can't hold their breath for this long. I'm traveling upstream, driving me boat, up doing these big S-bends and scouring the area. Scott frantically widens his search area, unaware he's losing his bearings. I was driving around madly after him. They couldn't have gone this far. After 10 minutes, he fears the worst. I thought they'd been taken, because there's big sharks out there. I thought their life was over, that's it. I've lost my son and my son's best mate. Dylan Briggs and Trevor Ketchian have disappeared in the Pacific Ocean. Dylan's dad searches frantically, but can't find them anywhere. They went down and that was the last I seen them. But Dylan and Trevor have surfaced. The five mile an hour currents on the reef have dragged them 150 feet away from where they first dived down. Dad Scott has lost his bearings and is heading in the wrong direction. I was looking around to see where the boat was and he wasn't there. We could just see him bobbling over like the, the swell maybe three or four hundred meters away. Dad! We were waving our guns and fins in the air and trying to get his attention. But he couldn't see us because of the waves. If staying afloat and trying to reach Dylan's dad isn't enough, all their movement is attracting sharks. At any second, the shark can turn and become aggressive. Then you are definitely shark food. They were coming in and then they turn at last minute. It was scary. The sharks begin to disperse. But by now, Scott is even further away. Is he serious? He lost this. Which direction was he lost? He just keep, starts swimming in his direction. Dylan's father is looking in the wrong direction. We realize that he's driving away from us. They decide to swim towards the boat so Scott can see them. I jumped straight on the radio. I've lost them. Ten minutes ago, I've lost them. I need somebody out here now. Get somebody out here. All right, clear, clear. From 70 miles away, 
Air Crew Officer Tim Sharman's helicopter rescue team responds to the call. Two people had gone missing in a vast ocean in deep water. No one was exactly sure where these individuals may be. OK, so habit security is good. Advise on speeds below 80 and we are clear doors. Tim is one of a four-man crew, including paramedic Ryan Salter. Water jobs are always quite time critical. We don't know if someone's injured. We don't know if they've become separated from each other. It will take the team 25 minutes to fly to Nine Mile Reef. All the while, the current is pulling Trevor and Dylan further away from Dylan's frantic dad. I'm not going to get up to him in this car. Nah, he's on the other side of Nine Mile. Looking for us where he dropped us off. He doesn't understand that current pulls. The longer we swim this way, the less chance we have of getting that way by dark. We can just tread water and hope for the best. Not unless he knows where to look, which is due south, kilometer by now. We decided to use what remaining energy we had in order to swim for land. Oh, this is going to be a long swim. We'll call him if we get to land. Hopefully he finds us or someone does on the way. They estimate it could take eight hours to reach shore, four miles away. By now, the rescue team closes in on Nine Mile Reef. We're responding to the location that these people were last seen. Every person in the helicopter needs to be searching for them. That is the reef. All right, so everyone eyes outside. These people could be from anywhere. Every second that we're not on scene is a time that the patients can move way out to sea. All right, so we're all secure in the rear cabin. We're looking for a black man stood in black water. It'd be tricky. Need to learn a get lucky. You look out of your window and see a vast ocean in front of you, and you're expecting not to find anything. What's racing through your mind is nothing but disastrous. It's really traumatising. I, I was dry reaching out there, thinking, I'm not going to see my son anymore. Two divers are lost in the Pacific Ocean. The search for them has become national news. The men aged 22 and 27 were on a family diving trip at Nine Mile Reef this morning when they went missing. The father of one of the divers raised the alarm. Now, Dylan and Trevor are attempting the daunting four-mile swim to shore. We were swimming as hard as we could and we were making no ground at all. It does look like it's getting closer. That or I'm hallucinating. Not taking much headway. Disappointed. Almost a mile away at Nine Mile Reef, the helicopter team has drawn a blank. If they've been swimming for the whole time, they're becoming fatigued. It's going to affect their ability to remain afloat. OK, that's an hour and 15 minutes down. Now nine to go. I started to feel bad muscle cramps in my legs. When fatigue sets in and you pass out, that's when bad things can happen. We had to continue searching, but where to search effectively was crucial for their survival. The current's hard to judge, but it's probably basically to the south side of the reef. So maybe if we do some southern runs along here, that be that plan? Yeah, yep, we're good. We elected to search following the current. You could hear the rotor blades of the helicopters. There was definitely a sense of relief, knowing that someone was out there looking for us. But the rescue team doesn't see them. When you go way out to sea, the water is deep, the water is black. 
Someone in a black wetsuit blends perfectly into the ocean environment. Yeah, but we're black on a blue surface, man. It was frustrating to see the helicopters fly over the top of us. He got angry and he would slap the water and venting his rage that way. So around here, guys, eyes out this side. I noticed out of the corner of my eye a splash. I spotted, spotted two divers, two divers, three o'clock. Two divers, three o'clock. We had found what we were looking for. Did they wave or anything? Yeah, they did. I've lost sight somewhere in this vicinity, one o'clock. Make a right turn, turn right. That is the worst possible feeling. Yeah, for sure, I'm need to relocate them. The rescue team scours the waves below. We should be able to see them, and a few seconds later, here we are searching for them again. All eyes outside. The crew combs the area for five minutes. Nothing. Oh, there, there. Left side at 7 o'clock now, see? They turned around, they stopped right above us. Good spot, yes. Yeah, they're just below us now. They were hovering above us, so we're like, wait, they've, they've found us. <laughs> we were stoked. First checks are complete, thumbs up, coming off on the way. Move down, go down to 50 feet. Moving on across the cabin. Holding on at the door, second checks. Hook, connectors, harness, vest, tin strap riser, gloves, and comp. Second checks are complete. Okay, Ryan is set. The ocean is moving, the helicopter's moving, the winchman's moving, and the people in the water are moving. The risks are, are, are quite high if done incorrectly. We're going to run in, advise, find them on the water. We're just going to hold Ryan tight in the water. Ryan lands within arm's reach of Dylan. And he grabbed hold of me and lifted me up. Now I was safe. News cameras capture the rescue. I seen a black figure coming up and out of the ocean. Well, that was it. I'm sprawled out in the middle of my boat, like thanking God. Okay. Okay, everyone is on board the aircraft. As I was in the helicopter and the door was closed, that's when I had time to actually start thinking about all the things that could have gone wrong, and I could have ended up dead. We are very thankful for the rescuers. I just walked straight up to Dad and gave him a big hug. All was forgiven, and you can't really get angry at someone for something like that. It's just a part of it.